Hi there, I'm Pastor Cliff Gleason, and I want to thank you for tuning in today to our worship service. Here at the Laconia Seventh-day Adventist Church, we worship Jesus Christ as our Creator, our Lord, our Savior, and our coming King. And we hope that you will enjoy this service with us, that you'll be inspired by the teaching and the music and every part of our service. So sit back and enjoy, and thank you for being with us today. Our scripture reading this morning is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 through 3. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verses 1 through 3. That's kind of in the middle of the epistles from Paul. Now you do not need to have anything written to you about times and dates, brothers. For you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. When people say there is peace and security, destruction will strike them as suddenly as labor pains come to a pregnant woman and they will not be able to escape. May the Lord bless his, the reading of his word, and we look forward to what Pastor Cliff will share with us this morning. We've been on a journey through Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians, and we come here into chapter, the middle of chapter 4, and we have a very, very positive passage. Sometimes the uh, writers of the scriptures had to deal with difficult things, and um, it could be challenging as they faced conflicts or as we were studying in the Sabbath school lesson, false teachings and the effects that it could have. But here, it, the emphasis is on the positive. Although it does come out of a false teaching that was going on at the time. Um, look at verse 13. We're in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. Even so, God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. There was a problem at the time where people were confused about the resurrection and about what happens to people who died before Jesus returns. Some teachers were saying that if you die before Jesus comes, you're out. You're gone. You don't get to go to heaven when Jesus comes. Wouldn't that be dreadful? That'd be an awfully discouraging thing to face that kind of teaching. Well, Paul says here, I don't want you to be ignorant. I want you to understand this teaching. Because he says, if you're ignorant, you won't have hope. Did you see that at the end of verse 13? Like those who have no hope. We don't want to be without hope. So, we don't want to be ignorant. And Paul says this. Hope comes with knowledge, then. We've got to know something. We've got to know the truth. And if we want a certain hope, there has to be a certain knowledge. A confident, a sure knowledge. Well, turn over. Hold your place here, because we're coming right back to this passage. But go over to another letter of Paul, 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians, just for a little bit, we're going to be looking at a passage there. Chapter 15, 1 Corinthians 15, that's Paul's premier chapter about the resurrection, about eternal life when Jesus comes. So we're going to look at that. <clears throat> I'm going to be reading it in the New Living Translation, and you can follow along with it, whatever translation you have. But Paul's talking about this problem that they were having with false teachers saying there is no resurrection. If you're dead, you're out, you're gone. 
And he's going to tell us what the truth is. So, so we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And I'm going to start with verse 12 and read several verses. <clears throat> but tell me this. Since we preach that Christ rose from the dead, why are some of you saying that there will be no resurrection of the dead? For if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, then all our preaching is useless, and your faith is useless. And we apostles would, be, would all be lying about God, for we have said that God raised Christ from the grave. But that can't be true if there is no resurrection of the dead. And if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless and you are still guilty of your sins. Boy, he's repeating himself here, isn't he? Whenever there's repeating in the Bible, it's saying this is really important. Don't miss it. Verse 18, in that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. Now, notice it doesn't say all who died believing in Christ are stuck up in heaven and they'll never get a resurrection body. It doesn't say that, does it? Now, unfortunately, there are many Christians who believe that when you die, if you're a believer, you, your soul leaves your body and goes up to heaven. And it's there until Jesus comes and then your soul comes back down to earth at the coming of Jesus and then you get a body. And you get an eternal body. You already have an eternal soul, they believe, but at that time you get an eternal body. But that's not what Paul says. Paul doesn't say you're stuck up in heaven with an eternal soul that can't have an eternal body. He doesn't say that. He says they're lost. That doesn't sound like they're already up in heaven enjoying things, does it? Interesting thought there. And we're going to see more about that in a little bit. All right, so... Verse 18 says, In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. But, I like that verse 20 says, But, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. Now verse 23 but there is an order to this resurrection. Christ has been raised as the first of the harvest. Then all who belong to Christ will be raised when he comes back. Is that clear? When he comes back. Now go down to verse 35. But someone may ask, how will the dead be raised? What kind of bodies will they have? What a foolish question. When you put a seed into the ground, it doesn't grow into a plant unless it first dies. And then going down to verse 42. It is the same way with the resurrection of the dead. Our earthly bodies are planted in the ground when we die. But they will be raised to live forever. Our bodies are buried in brokenness. Do you feel broken sometimes? Boy, I feel broken sometimes. They're buried in brokenness, but they will be raised in glory. As, will there be any more brokenness? No more brokenness. They'll be raised in glory. They are buried in weakness, but they will be raised in strength. And then it goes on, verse 44, they are buried as natural human bodies, but they will be raised as spiritual bodies. Like the body Jesus had when he raised from the dead, right? And we know he, how he ate and how he talked with people and they recognized him. So don't think a spiritual body is like a ghost or something. That's not the way Jesus was when he raised from the dead. Spiritual bodies. But just as there are natural bodies, there are also spiritual bodies. Then go down to verse 51. But let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. We will not all die, but we will all be transformed. It will happen in a moment, in the blink of an eye, when the last trump is blown. For when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to live forever. 
and we who are living will also be transformed. For our dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die. And our mortal bodies must be transformed into immortal bodies. Then, when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, the scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? For sin is the sting that results in death. And the law gives sin its power. But thank God he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that a great chapter? We weren't able to study it all the way through, but you get the idea from that reading that that's a, a chapter of victory, a chapter of confidence, a chapter of great hope. And that's what we're looking at today. The hope of Jesus coming. Now after reading all of that, where it talks about the resurrection of Jesus, that Jesus has been raised from the dead. How do you know it's true? I mean, the Bible says it, but how do you know it's true? Well, I hope everybody talked to Jesus this, this morning. You know he's alive. Because you're talking with him. You're sharing your life with him day by day. He's not dead in the tomb someplace. He's alive. And he hears your prayers. And he answers your prayers. He's your living Lord and friend and Savior. Now let's go to verse 14. We're back in Thessalonians now. Let's turn back to Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And we looked at verse 13. Now let's look at verse 14. For if we believe... That Jesus died and rose again. That's what 1 Corinthians 15 was all about. It says, Even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. So, those who have died believing in Jesus, do, can they have hope? Can there be hope for them that they would have eternal life? Yes, this is it. It says it. You see, he who has the Son has what? Has life. The scripture says there in 1 John, he who has the Son has life. Why? Because Jesus is the life giver. He's the source of life. If you have him, you have the source of life. What a great hope. What a great confidence. So if you have Jesus, you have life, and you have hope. Hope for tomorrow and hope for today. Now let's go to verse 15. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord. By whose, whose word? Was it by Paul's word? Was it by Barnabas' word? Or Peter? No, it's the word of the Lord. We're telling you by the word of the Lord. And look at verse, as it goes on, it says that we who, that those, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede or go before those who who are asleep. And it goes on talking about his coming again. Where did Jesus ever talk about coming again? Is it in the Bible? Can you think of one place? In my Father's house are what? Many mansions, many rooms, many dwelling places. And I'm going to do what? To prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will what? I will come again. Does anybody know where that passage is found? Gospel of John chapter 14, the first three verses. You're right. Beautiful, beautiful promise. One of the best promises. We call it the blessed hope. The hope of Jesus coming again to take us to the very places He's prepared for us. Do you think He's going to prepare those places thoughtfully? Do you think He's going to prepare them creatively? Is he going to have some favorite thing there for you? Some interesting thing? Surely he will. He's preparing a place and he says, if I go, I'm coming again. The very words of Jesus. Now it mentions here in verse 15, it says that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord. Will any of us be alive when Jesus comes? We don't know, do we, for sure. I know I've been looking for the coming of Jesus since around 1965. 
How long ago was that? Don't figure it out. I was a wee lad. <laughs> and you know, I figured it out when I got baptized in 66. So that's 40, 51 years ago. I had it figured out when Jesus was coming. You see, all you have to do is figure it out this way. G when, when Noah preached, because Jesus says, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the coming of the days of man, Son of Man, right? Didn't he say that? And now, how long did Moses preach about the coming of the flood? Did I say Noah? What did I say? Oh, Moses, yeah. Let's try Noah. How long did Noah preach about the flood? 120 years. So, the Adventist message about the second coming started in what year? 1844. What's 120 years later? 1964. It was 1966 when I was... Boy, that fits pretty close, doesn't it? But we've gone past 120 years. So then I remembered when Moses... When Moses... Let's try Noah again. When Noah went into the ark, did the, did the water start coming that day? No. How many days did it take? Seven days before the water actually came, when the flood actually came, right? And in the Bible, a day in prophecy stands for a, a year. So I thought, oh, that's seven years. So 120 years brings us to 1964. And seven more years brings us to what? 1971. That's only, when it was 1966, that's only four years ahead. <gasps> I thought, Jesus is coming in 1971. Well, now you know I'm not a good prophet, am I? <laughs> and I wasn't a very good interpreter of prophecy back then either, as you can tell. But I was doing that new math. <laughs> but I was looking for what the fulfillment of Jesus promised that he's coming again. Now, we don't know when he's coming again. It well, certainly wasn't 1971. <laughs> And how many of us who've been, who've been uh, following and walking with Jesus for many decades, how many of us ever thought the year 2000 would come? I never thought 2000 would come. Never, never. And here we are, 2017. Now we don't know how much longer it's going to be. It might be another 20 years. It might be only another two years. Now, if Jesus comes in two years, how many of us will probably be alive? Probably all of us. Now, what do you think about that? Being alive and actually see Him coming in the clouds of glory. Wow. I believe that everything that the Bible says that needs to happen before Jesus comes, I believe everything could happen within two or three years. But we don't know. We don't know. But it does say some will be alive, some will be looking, some will be ready. Do you want to be among those, if Jesus is coming soon, do we want to be among those who are ready? Then let's cooperate with him. Let's cooperate with him. How did Noah and his family cooperate? Doing what he said. And what did Noah say to do? First, build an ark, right? And then what else? Well, before the gathering of the animals, preach the word that the flood is coming, but you can be saved from the flood if you get into the ark, right? And then the animals were gathered and all the other things that had to be done. Does God have a message a direction, a set of directions to us who live before Jesus comes. What are they? Well, the commandments, but the commandments have been, they were given how many years ago? About 3,500 years ago. Is there anything more specific? The gospel being preached to the world. That's like the preaching of Noah, right? Preaching, going all over the world. Is that happening? I hope you can watch Hope Channel. Do you ever watch Hope Channel? You can get it on the internet. Go to Hope TV. 
and watch Mission 360. Anybody here ever see Missions 360? It's fantastic. They, they were on talking this morning about, let's see, what country was that? It was uh, one with the biggest one of the biggest mosques in the world. And they were telling about the work of God going forth in that country. It just slipped my mind. I can't remember the, which country it was. And, but then they, they, they were showing several other countries in between. And it's amazing what's happening all over the world. The gospel is going forth just the way Jesus said. What else? What other directions does God give to his last people before Jesus comes? His, I'm going to give you a hint, his last church before Jesus comes. Yes, where do you find that? Where do you find that? Revelation 3. That's right, Revelation 3, the seventh church, a church of Laodicea. And he says, first of all, I know that you're neither hot or cold, you're lukewarm, you think you're rich and increased with goods, but you're really poor and naked and wretched and miserable and blind. And so buy of me gold. the gold tried in the fire, yeah. the eye salve, and, and the white raiment. Basically, he's saying there, you don't know how needy you are. Now, who's that directed to? To us. You don't know how needy. So do we know how needy we are? We don't. Can anyone help us with that? Who can help us? Jesus can help us. And wh who did he send to help us? The Holy Spirit. When we pray for the Holy Spirit, let's pray for the Holy Spirit to help us to see how needy we are. Now that's a hard one because we don't like to think about being needy. That's a hard one. But that's what Jesus is saying to his last people. If you want to be ready, if you want to be those, those who are alive and ready for his coming, you've got to know how needy you are. And then he says, after some, I, we don't have time to go into all the details of it, but that's the primary thing. And the next thing he says is repent. In other words, repent of feeling so satisfied. Repent of feeling like you know it all. You've got the message. You've got the, you know the Bible. You've studied it all. You took all the Bible studies and you know it. And you don't need to study and dig deep into God's word anymore. Repent of that and turn around, which means to start doing what? Start digging deep. Start digging deep. Start finding things in the Bible that you've never really seen before. Isn't that what it is? That's what he's saying. And if you dig deep, if you search for beautiful things from God's Word that you've never seen before, guess what will happen? You'll find. Jesus said, seek and you will find. And if you seek for the beautiful things of Jesus, the beautiful things of the gospel, the wonderful things about our Heavenly Father in His Word, guess what the Holy Spirit's going to do? He's going to open those blind eyes. And you'll see things, and you will rejoice. And then you'll do the last thing it says there in Lave to see it. You'll overcome as Jesus overcame. In, in uh, Concord, we're doing a midweek series on the, the uh, experience of Jesus from Gethsemane to his resurrection. And we got to the chapter from Desire of Ages called, It is Finished. And it says there that the more Satan attacked Jesus in the garden and in his trial and on the cross, the more that the Satan attacked him, what did Jesus do? Did anybody know? The firmer he held on to the hand of his father. Now whose hand do you like to hold? Somebody you what? Somebody you trust. And even better, somebody you trust and admire. And you hold. And Jesus was holding on 
walked more firmly. The more Satan attacked, he held on more firmly. <coughs> and so we need to overcome as Jesus overcame. Well, that's, that's nothing extra. You can just go back and study. Uh, there will be no extra cost for that this morning. But that would give you a little taste of what there, what's there in Revelation 3. The, the nickels were... <laughs> All right. Now it says at the end of verse 15, it says, we will by no means precede those who are asleep. So if we're not going to go ahead of the people who have died before Jesus comes, but then they're resurrected at the coming of Jesus, we don't go before them and they don't go before us. So we all go together. Isn't that great? I love that. Have you ever gone on a vacation as a family or a couple to a place that neither of you or none of you have ever been to before? And you all, you all get to see it for the first time together. Isn't there something special about that? I mean, I, I had one situation where I went to a certain place on a, a mission trip and I went and Sue wasn't with me. I was with a gr another group. And then later on, I got to bring her to that same place years later. And she enjoyed it very much. She liked that. I knew she would. And I enjoyed showing her the things that I had seen before. But we also had some extra time to go to some parts of that country that I had never been to before. And we both got to see it for the first time. And that was better than the parts that I got to go first and then show her later. God thinks of everything. He knows that it's going to be most exciting if we all get there together. I think that's great. And that's what he has implied. We don't go before, we go together. Now it mentions they're asleep. Now asleep means not conscious, but your identity is preserved for when you wake up. Now, how many of you fell asleep last night? Yeah, I fell asleep last night. And do you know, I'm the same person, unfortunately for my life, I'm the same person <laughs> as the one who fell asleep last night. And how many of us are the same people that we fell asleep last night? We're the same. Now, suppose you had an accident, like we had uh, a gentleman from the Concord Church had a head-on collision about a month ago uh, in Northwood. And he was almost killed. He had, I don't know how many, did you ever hear how many bones were broken? All of his limbs needed multiple surgeries. Can you imagine? It was a terrible, terrible accident. And they, they I guess he was unconscious, of course, probably at the very beginning, but then they put him in an induced coma so that the brain wouldn't swell and so that he wouldn't have to deal with the pain issues and they could continue doing the surgeries that were needed. Now suppose a person is in a coma like that. Suppose they're in a coma for two weeks and then they come forth. Usually are they the same person who fell asleep? Now there can be brain injuries but if there's no brain injury, if sometimes a brain injury will cause a change of a personality or certain issues. But if there's no brain injury, the person's the same one who two weeks ago went into the coma. Now, have you ever heard of some people having a coma or having a surgery or a, a death accident where they die for several minutes and then they come back and then they say, oh, I saw a tunnel of light and these bright beings, or I saw this or that, or I went to hell, and I was in, being tortured in hell, and I came back afterwards. Have you ever heard of those stories? Yeah. Well, I guess we have to throw the Bible out then, because the Bible says that we're sleeping, and we, you don't know anything. In fact, in, in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, it says the dead know how much? Nothing. It says they're... Their thinking and their loving and their affections and everything has perished. It's gone. It's not existing while they're sleeping in death. And, and it says that in several places. When Jesus had a friend named Lazarus who died, Jesus said he is what? He's asleep. And when Lazarus was brought back from death after four days of being dead, 
How much did he tell about what it was like to be dead? He told nothing. So the Bible says they know nothing, and then Lazarus told nothing. That fits together, doesn't it? Well, then what do we do with these experiences of real live people who say they went to heaven or they went to hell or some other experience? What do we do? What's more important, the experience of a person or what the Bible says? The Bible actually is stronger evidence than what a person feels they have experienced. Now you've got to settle that right now. You and I have to settle that issue because the book of Revelation says that before Jesus returns, Satan is going to be allowed to do many deceptive miracles and wonders. And people are going to see things and they're going to experience things and they're going to say, I can't accept what the Bible says because of what I experienced. And I've run into a few people who've already had some of those experiences. And they would not accept what the Bible says because they experienced something different. But let me tell you, the Bible is more reliable than human experience. And that's something we've got to settle. We've got to be sure of it. We've got to be led by God's Word, not by experiences. All right, so the first part of our sermon is that there's hope in the coming of Jesus. The second thing is, who is coming? Well, look at verse 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven. Ah, oh, it's not another Jesus, is it? And it's not a disciple. It's not a prophet. It's Jesus himself. This is the same Jesus who was born in Bethlehem. The same Jesus who served in the carpenter shop under Joseph. The same Jesus who healed people of all diseases. The same Jesus who loved sinners and harlots and tax collectors. The same Jesus who died on the cross and rose again. That's the Jesus who's coming. This is the same person that you love. The Jesus that you admire. The Jesus you talk to every day. The Jesus you depend on. The Jesus who is your all. He is coming again. Isn't that wonderful? Praise his name. Now also verse 16 tells us how is Jesus coming? It says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise. Wow, look at that. He's coming the very same way he left. In Acts chapter 1, it says when he left, the angels were standing there. He said, This same Jesus who was taken up in the clouds is coming in the same manner. He went with clouds. He went with angels. They could see him. It was glorious. And he's coming the same way. Every eye will see him. He's coming with the Father's glory. The dead will rise. Is this a secret thing? There's no secret here. In fact, in Matthew chapter 24, he said, if they say it's secret, don't believe it. And who is coming with him? Who does it say? The angels. And the angels love the fact that you're going to heaven. They love it. They're excited for you. They can't wait to get you to heaven so they can show you around and so that they can share with you and they can hear your testimony about what God did for you. He's coming with the angels. Now the next thing is, where is Jesus coming? Is he coming to Pluto? Well, it's not a planet anymore, but to Mars or Venus? He's coming to this sin-darkened world. But is he coming to the ground? Look what it says there in verse 17. And then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord on the ground. Is that what it says? To meet the Lord in Jerusalem over there in Israel someplace? Is that what it says? Or to meet him in Africa or the desert or some secret place? Is that what it says? It says to meet him in the air. In the air. Where every eye will see him. There will be no secret thing. It will be in the clouds. It will be glorious. And the angels will be there. We'll meet him in the air. 
so that he can take us home. Don't be fooled by a Jesus who comes to some secret place or even to Washington, D.C. or Los Angeles or Hollywood or wherever. Don't be fooled. Because Jesus, the Jesus who's coming with the angels and raising of the dead is going to meet us in the air. All right, then. Why is Jesus coming? We know how he's coming now. We know where he's coming. But why is he coming? He's coming because he wants you. He can't stand to be separated from you. He wants you forever with him. That's why he's coming. Jesus said, if I, if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again to receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. Can you imagine Jesus taking you by the hand? Can you imagine Jesus putting his arms around you and giving you a welcome hug to heaven? He's coming for you because he wants you. That's what it's all about. Now the last thing. What difference does it make that Jesus is coming again? Well, right now, look at verse 18. This tells the now part. Verse 18. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. What difference does it make now? Comfort. Comfort. Do we need any comfort in this world of sin and trouble and tragedy? <coughs> A world of heartache and separation that death causes? I think we've all lost loved ones that we wish we could be united with even today. Well, not in this sinful world where there's more trouble. We don't want that. But we're looking forward to the resurrection day. We're looking for the day when Jesus comes because the troubles will be over. The sicknesses will be over. The weakness will be over. And we'll be reunited. And we're looking forward to that. And it's comforting to know it's real. It's real. Jesus is coming. The dead will be raised. We will have an eternal life with no more sin. So it makes a difference now about whether we ha can have comfort or not. But what about on the day when Jesus comes? Does it make a difference that he's coming? Makes a difference whether we believe it now because we can be prepared for his coming. Because on that day he comes, will everybody be ready? No. Some will not be believers. Some will not be linked in with Jesus. They'll not trust him and love him. So what will they do when he comes? It says they'll hide. They'll be afraid. They'll want to run away from him. Oh, we don't want that experience. We don't want that experience. So the question is, are we ready? Is it hard to be ready for Jesus to come? Oh, no, it's not. Just surrender. Surrender to his love. Surrender to his faith in you. Surrender to his care for you. Surrender to his ability to do everything that's needed to bring you all the way home victorious. Surrender to him. But will you? That's the question. It's not hard. You can. He's given you that ability through the work of the Holy Spirit for you to surrender to His grace and love. But will you? You'll need to make some sacrifices. Because you know there are things that, are, that invade in every person's life and heart. People or things that claim a higher priority in your life than God. And you know what they are because the Holy Spirit's been speaking to you already. That you have to surrender first place for the, from those things to Jesus. That's what's needed. That's the sacrifice. Do you want to have Jesus change that in you to make Him first place in your life? Will you today start to fill your every day with Jesus? How do you do that? Well, we talked about it in Sabbath school. Remember what things we said? How we can fill the house. Remember the empty house? 
And the devil came back with seven more and they got it, it had a big party there and took over everything. Like squatters on somebody's empty property. But in order to fill the house so that don't, doesn't happen, we said, what could we do? How could we fill our life with Jesus? What did we say? Fellowship with other Christians. That's right. What else? Service to others. Serving the way Jesus served. Yes? Anything else? But studying the Word. Looking into the Scriptures. Remember searching for those beautiful things about the Lord that we haven't seen before. What's another? Nature. Going out into nature, seeing the things of beauty that come from the hand of God. Something else? Maybe somebody said it. Pardon? Encouraging, Encouraging others, yes. Prayer. And prayer. That's the big one that we had missed. Talking to the Lord, opening your heart to Him. And not only that, we often think opening the heart to God in the sense that I need to share with God my questions, my burdens, my doubts, my difficulties, my joys. But we forget something that is perhaps more important than any or even all of those things. It's we're, we're praying... Thanks is good. Praise. Praise. Opening your heart to how good and big and wonderful God is. And expressing that to Him. That's the way of cherishing His righteousness. Is by expressing it to Him in prayer. It's huge. And I believe that's what Jesus did to the fall. If you read the Psalms... You'll get it. So will you choose Jesus today? Will you choose him now? I used to be the pastor in the Cape Cod Church down in Massachusetts. And there was a group of Adventists that met on Martha's Vineyard. That's a little island, you know, down on the south of uh, Cape Cod. Just offshore about, what was it, six miles or so. And But the... You know, we had a, a ferry that would go over there. So I would preach in the morning at the Cape Cod Church and then jump in my car and I'd have a sack lunch and I'd run right down to Woods Hole or Falmouth, wherever the ferry was going out. And I would catch the ferry quickly and go over to the island and they had somebody there with a vehicle and they'd pick me up, take me to the rented hall or the home, wherever we were going to be meeting. And we'd have a little informal service. And then if there were some new people, we'd have a Bible study with them. And then they'd get me back to the ferry to get the ferry back over and then I can get home. So one day I was over there. It was a nice uh, day, a lot like today, I imagine. And and uh, they picked me up at the, at the ferry there on the island and they took me to the worship time and then I stayed for a Bible study. And you won't believe this, but sometimes I talk too much. <laughs> and that was one of those days and I wasn't watching the clock. And all of a sudden I realized, oh, we've got to get out of here quick to the ferry or I'm going to miss it. And so we rushed and they drove as fast as they could and we got there just in time to see the ferry pulling away from the dock. And I, always, I was tempted to grab my things and run down the dock and jump over the water onto the ferry. But it was too late for that. It was too late. One day it's going to be too late. And you know, our decision doesn't just affect us. That day, my decision or my lack of attention did not just affect me. Because my wife was at home with two little children. They were very young at the time. And she was scheduled to go to work that night at 11 o'clock, 11 to 7. She can't leave two kids, two little kids at home alone. And so she had to call in and say to the supervisor, I can't make it. My husband's not going to be here. And, and so it affected my wife. It affected the boss. Because now what is the boss going to do? Now being down a nurse and, you know, all the, it, the ripple effect. 
whether you put Jesus first has a ripple effect. It's not just you. It's people around you that's affected by your decision. Will you put Jesus first today and be ready for the coming of the Lord? And your decision to put Jesus first also has a ripple effect to help others get ready for his coming. So that we can go home, how? Together with the Lord and forever to be with him. Let's pray. Our Father, we know today's decision time. And many of us have made decisions like this before. But then, as the Bible says, there's backsliding that happens. And sometimes it's ourselves and sometimes it's Satan that gets in with things to try to take a higher priority to take up more attention, more time, more loyalty than you. And Lord, we thank you that the Holy Spirit is very gentle but very persistent to come to us and to help us to see the things we don't want to see and to help us to understand that changes need to, be, need to happen. And that now is the time to get close to you, to surrender to your love and grace and truth and power. Not only so that we won't miss the boat, so to speak, but so that you can be glorified in us and others can join us on that great boat going to heaven. We'll meet you in the air. We'll travel, to travel together a grand procession who have enjoyed the victories that you have given us. This is our hope, our blessed hope that we enjoy with great confidence today because we have a mighty Savior and a wonderful Father and an insightful Holy Spirit who knows just how to work with us. We give you the praise and the glory for it all. In Jesus' name, amen. And now let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Amen. when soon you'll be able to come right to our facility. We're here at 241 Province Street in Laconia, and our services are on Saturday mornings at 11 o'clock for the worship service, 9.30 if you want to come earlier for the Bible study. You're always welcome. We'd love to have you come. And there's a special thing that happens on the second Saturday of every month. That's our fellowship meal. And we'd love to you, for you to be able to be with us and to stay afterwards and enjoy the lunch with us. Now, you may also be inspired to want to study the Bible some more. And we do have different Bible study aids. We can provide something for you to study through the mail. Or we can come to your home. Or we can arrange a small group study here at the church. So be in contact with us and we will be able to set up something that will meet your needs as best we can. Thank you again and we look forward to meeting you. God bless you in every way.
come back now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah.